Welcome to New Hope. We're so glad that you're here with us. And you know, we're a bit biased, but we believe you couldn't have picked a better service to be a part of. We have powerful teaching, great worship in store, but remember if there's any way that we can be praying for you, we'd love to do so. So in our description is a link that you can select that will put you in contact with our staff team so that we can care for you. But let's go ahead and praise God together. Good morning, New Hope Church. Happy Sunday, we're so glad you're here. Come on and stand if you're able. Let's worship Jesus together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain.
here to worship you, Jesus. You deserve all the glory. How great the castle that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished. My living hope is so beautiful, Jesus. Who could imagine so great?
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name is stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name is stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cry.
Yes, you are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. God, you deserve the glory. Come on, y'all, sing it out. You are worthy of it all. God, you are worthy of it all. You're worthy of all of our attention and all of our devotion. God, when you come, things change. So we ask that you would meet with us, you would speak to us, and you would teach us a new thing we pray right here, right now today, God. It's in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus that we all said, amen. Well, we have a powerful service in store as we continue on in our Jesus Unscripted series. But one of our greatest passions here at New Hope is making a difference through our missional partners. So go ahead and check this out. Hey, New Hope, I'm here today with Tim Currington, who is the executive director of our ministry partner, Prison Alliance. Thank you for allowing us to be here today, Tim. Could you share with New Hope exactly what Prison Alliance is all about? Sure. So Prison Alliance, our mission really is to impact God's kingdom by sharing the gospel with people behind bars, with the incarcerated, and then discipling them through our Bible study program. And so I like to say it this way, just to kind of make it really clear for somebody, we are a discipleship ministry that God has specifically used to target people behind bars. Thank you for what you do and how you lead here. Could you also share with New Hope the current campaign that y'all are in the middle of. Yeah, so we are excited about a Bible campaign that we're in the middle of right now. From March through the end of June, we're trying to raise $100,000 to purchase 20,000 Bibles to send to prisons all over the country. Can you also share with New Hope how we have partnered alongside Prison Alliance? Yeah, well, we love our church partner, New Hope. You all have done an incredible job of partnering alongside of us to reach people behind bars. And you've done book drives for us and financially donated to us, and we're so grateful for that. And New Hope, we have lots more opportunities coming up this fall, a serve opportunity right here in the warehouse, as well as a book and Bible collection that we'll be doing on their behalf. So watch for those opportunities coming this fall.
That is exciting stuff. Hey, let me welcome all of you here on our campus. I wanna welcome everybody joining us online. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name's Adam, and uh, I'm excited you're here. We're gonna continue in our teaching series in just a minute, but first, uh, we gotta talk about Tuesday night. If you haven't heard yet, we're doing a vision night at 7 p.m. Um, in this room, and I do not want you to miss. We're gonna talk about a lot of exciting things. I'm gonna tease it out just a little right now, okay? So first thing I'm gonna talk about a lot is what we're gonna do with the playground space that we're renovating. So those of you who call New Hope Home know that we raised a lot of money back in our Christmas offering. One of the initiatives was to renovate that space into children's ministry space or student ministry space. We were looking at a lot of different options. Uh, well, we have the blueprints and we also have some drawings and I'm gonna take y'all on a tour. It's gonna be awesome, all right? Yeah, <laughs> Tuesday night. I'm also gonna share with you what's the plan gonna be when all that construction starts and what all that gonna look like. And then we're also gonna talk about um, adding a third service. So we've been talking about this for a while. If you look around this room, there are really no seats left. I mean, the parking lot, good luck, that's all I can say. So it's just a little bit fun when you've got a lot of people coming to church, but we need a third service, so we're gonna add a third service. I'm gonna tell you Tuesday night when that's gonna happen, how all that's gonna go down, and so you don't wanna miss out. It's gonna be a lot of fun, but I need you to register. So if you haven't already registered, do so with the QR code. Um, we will provide childcare if you wanna take advantage of that, but it's super laid back. I mean, feel free to bring your kids um, with you into the room if you so choose. But again, Tuesday night, seven o'clock, vision night, it's going to be awesome. Before today, Jesus Unscripted, maybe you're just jumping in today for the first time, welcome. We're glad you're here. We've been in the Gospel of Mark, and we're just taking a look at some stories from Jesus' life. We're reading them, we're seeing what they mean, and obviously seeing how we can apply them to our lives today. So I'm gonna jump right in today. We're gonna be in Mark chapter four, and the title of our message is Led into the Storm. See, this is not a title of a sermon if you want attendance to go up. I'm just gonna tell you right now, okay? This is not in the church growth handbook. Tell everybody that Jesus wants to lead them into a storm, all right? But that's exactly what we're gonna see today. Now, here's why that matters. Some of you are walking through a storm. And you may have come in here today thinking that your storm is God's punishment in your life. That the storm is because of something that you've done. And what I hope happens today is you leave thinking, wait a second. What if Jesus actually led me into the storm? What if this was actually his idea? And what if there are some things he actually wants to show me about himself through my storm? So if you're walking through a storm today, let me encourage you. I think that you're gonna see some hope and I think you're gonna leave today experiencing a side of our Savior that perhaps you've never seen before. But let's read the story in its entirety and then we're gonna back up, kind of work our way through it again. Mark chapter four, verses 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he, meaning Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them, excuse me, with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. The wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So it's a pretty straightforward story, one that a lot of people have heard. Maybe if you haven't really ever been a part of a church, you may have even heard this particular story before at your grandmama's church growing up or something like that, that Jesus was in a storm and he told the waves and he told the wind to stop and they did. But what I want us to do is work our way back through it. I do think there's some applications for us. As we look at how Jesus handled this particular storm, it gives us hope and insight into how he helps us, leads us, guides us as we walk through our storms and life. So if you're taking notes, here's the first application for today. Sometimes Jesus leads you into the storm. I just alluded to that a second ago, but in this story, this whole thing is his idea. I mean, Jesus is gonna go to the disciples. In fact, if you missed the verse, I know I just read it, but let's just circle back around. Here's how it starts. That evening, that day, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Jesus initiated all this. Jesus is the one that said, hop in the boat. Jesus is the one that led them into a storm. And sometimes this is a part of our faith that we just don't talk enough about. It's not a really good popular topic for a life group. Or back in the day, an old school Sunday school class, when somebody tells you, hey, Jesus may actually lead you 
into a storm. And there's a lot of people who walk away from faith when they find themselves in a storm because no one ever told them this. That Jesus will sometimes lead you in a storm. And I say, well, why would he do that? Well, it's our big idea for today. It's kind of long. We're going to put it up here on the screen. You might want to take a screenshot of it. So let's walk through this, okay? Our big idea. When Jesus wants to get you somewhere, show you something about himself, or grow your faith, oftentimes he will lead you into a storm. Now, we're going to leave this up here for just a second because this says some things. So let's unpack this. First of all, when Jesus wants to get you somewhere... It was mentioned earlier, we're gonna honor our graduating seniors here in just a few weeks. If you're a graduating high school senior, you're getting ready to move to your next season of life. It might be college, it might be trade school, it might be a year uh, backpacking Europe, which I would suggest. I'm just saying right now, okay? (laughs) Just take a year. Don't do anything productive. That'd be awesome. Your parents will email me later. Anyway, so just do something fun, okay? (laughs) But when you transition from one season to the next, it can feel like a storm. Man, here's the thing. I'm just, I'm just for a second. All my life in church, I've heard things like when Jesus or God is guiding you, you'll just have a peace. <laughs> now, I get the intent. The intent is they're talking about the peace and the security that comes internally from knowing the Lord. I can totally sign off on that. But what it's created is the perception that if you walk with the Lord, everything around you is peaceful. That's not the case. A lot of times when you're going through transitions internally, it feels like a storm. Sometimes Jesus wants to move you physically. Many of you have moved here for your career. You've done so out of obedience, and yet it feels like a storm. I mean, sometimes Jesus wants to show you something about himself. There are things about our Savior you will only know or experience when you go through a storm. And he's going to lead you there because he loves you. And there's things about himself that he wants you to know. And oftentimes he'll grow your faith. Faith is so misunderstood. We think faith is when we just tell ourselves we can do it. Faith is when we like don't lose courage. Like faith is when we just kind of muster up this emotion. No, faith oftentimes feels like just putting one foot in front of the other. See, as long as you can see God moving in your life, faith is not required. But when you can't see because you're in a storm, Now you have to move forward in faith. And for many of us, we live a life of comfort. Oh, I'm gonna come after you now. We live a life of comfort. (laughs) How's the Lord gonna get our attention? Lead us into a storm to eventually then grow our faith. If no one's ever told you this is a part of the normative experience of walking with the Lord, let me encourage you. This is not meant to discourage you. It's meant to encourage you that Jesus will do this in our lives oftentimes And he will lead us into a storm. But see, here's the second point for today. Not everybody gets invited into Jesus' boat. There's a privilege in being led into the storm. Being chosen, invited into the boat. I'm going to lead you somewhere that I'm not leading Everyone else, did you catch it in the story? Let's go back and look at the verse, verse 36. Leaving the crowd behind. That'd make a really good tattoo. (laughs) You're still out there for free. John, why don't you get that one taken care of, all right? That'd be good. (laughs) Leaving the crowd behind. Part of walking with the Lord. They took him along just as he was in the boat, and there were also other boats with him. This is interesting. There's a bunch of people on the shore. Jesus handpicks the disciples and says, y'all get in the boat. And they leave the crowd behind. There are other boats around them that apparently did not follow Jesus's boat into the storm. See, not everybody gets chosen to be on Jesus's boat, to be led into a storm. But when he does that, there's some very specific reasons and some things he's trying to accomplish when it comes to our spiritual growth. And this whole idea of leaving the crowd, it kind of brought to mind uh, an an image, something that I've used for years, and it's something that's kind of in the fabric of who we are as a church at New Hope as well. So we're gonna put this up here, we're gonna talk about it for a second, because I think this really matters when it comes to our own personal discipleship, and it also matters when it comes to the mission of our church. And so I didn't come up with this. Rick Warren, who pastored Saddleback Church in Southern California for over 40 years, recently retired, he came up with this, and it's helped a lot of us over the years, and there's five concentric circles. They say community, crowd, congregation, committed, core. And as you look at this, you'll notice that each circle gets smaller as you move closer towards the middle. Every Sunday when you come onto our campus, you walk under the words, reach, teach, 
and release. That's our mission here at New Hope Church. And everything we do, we exist to reach our community, that, that outer circle. And just for a second, as a reminder, you exist to reach the people in your community. It might be your neighborhood, it might be your campus, it might be where you work, but we are all called to reach people in our community. The, the next circle says crowd. Now, someone is in the crowd when we've actually reached them. Not in a way where they've asked Jesus to come into their life, but reached them in a way where they've participated with something here on our campus. Maybe it was an event we had on our campus. Maybe they came at Easter, or maybe they came at Christmas Eve, or maybe they've come a couple of times, but they know of New Hope Church. In fact, they might even call New Hope Church their home, but they're not really involved. The congregation is y'all. The congregation are the people who show up every single week, and the congregation changes from week to week because perfect attendance is not a requirement at New Hope. Praise the Lord, right? We don't check at the door. It's not required, all right? So there's a different congregation every week because people travel, their kids get sick, all the things. Next, you have the committed. In many ways, the committed are the people who make this place go. The committed are all the people who greeted you on your way in today, which just for a second, can we say thank you to all those people? They do such a great job every single week. The committed are all of the people who are serving your kids right now and teaching them about Jesus, serving in production, serving on the worship team. It takes an army of people to make new hope happen, and the committed are those folks. And then finally, there's the core. The core is symbolized by the word surrendered. These are individuals who have surrendered every area of their life, their time, their talent, their treasure. They have sold out for Jesus, their life is not their own, and they are marked by selflessness, sacrifice, and serving. And so as you look at these concentric circles, what I hope you can see is this is a really helpful picture for what it means to take steps in your spiritual growth. So where are you today in these circles? See, all of us are at different places in our journey, but all of us have a next step to take. And you and the Lord know what that next step is. But at all times, we are moving forward and we are in process walking with Jesus. But just for a second, our story says leaving the crowd behind. And I can't help but draw the correlation between our story today and this picture. Because you see, if you wanna move forward in your faith, you're gonna have to leave the crowd behind. And there are fewer people with each step you take. So if your deciding factor for whether or not you move forward in your spiritual growth is to see who else is with you, good luck with that plan. Good luck with that plan. There has to come a point in all of our lives where we say, I'm gonna leave the crowd behind. I'm going to move forward by faith and grow along with Jesus. But as you do, the crowd will continually try to pull you back. But if Jesus invites you into his boat, what does that mean? He invites you into a deeper place of walking with him. Might I encourage you to get in the boat. Leave the crowd behind. Experience all that he has for you. But just for a second, let me just challenge some folks. Hey, guys, men, if you're a husband and you're a dad, let me challenge you, leave the crowd behind. The, the devil will leave you alone as long as you keep playing the church game. You know what church game is? We're really good at the church game. The church game is, I have like one toe in the church. I mean, I'm not completely pagan or atheist. Like I have a Bible. I might read it every now and then. And, and I kind of do the church thing when it's convenient. But pastor, I mean, my kids do all these different travel teams and we've got this and we've got the other. And, and when we get around to church, we'll do it. Hey, start leading. Start leading. I'm giving you permission, dads. I'm giving you permission, husbands, because I love you and I care about you, and I are one of you. Tonight at dinner, sit down with your family and say, dad needs to own some things and apologize. From this day forward, being a part of God's family will be a priority for this family. And guess what everybody's gonna do? They won't do that. They will not applaud, okay? <laughs> they will not rise up and call you blessed. I promise you. They will argue, complain, and whine. And you keep leading, you keep leading, keep leading. That's why we depend on one another, men. We have to have brothers, a band of brothers. If we do this together, we encourage one another because see, here's what we know, those of us who are dads, when our kids are the adults in this world, it will be darker than it is now. We've gotta ground their faith down deep, rooted, Colossians 2 says. Now, 
And listen, my wife and I, we got three boys, 14, 12, and eight. And can I tell you, as the pastor of this church, what I know I need, other brothers and sisters in Christ in their lives as well. So, so lead, so lead. But when you lead and you leave the crowd behind, don't always expect that everybody's going to understand. But when Jesus invites you into his boat, it's because he has something for you. Here's the third point. Storms don't affect Jesus the way they do us. I love this about the story. I love that while all this is happening, and it's a pretty big storm, as we see in the account, um, there's some details about Jesus that just make this story fantastic. I don't think it's the best part of the story, but it is certainly my favorite part of the story, okay? So let's go back to verses 37 and, eight, 37 and 38. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping with a Snuggie. I think that's what the original Greek says. I think that's what it said. And they translate it as cushion. Now, if you have a Snuggie, I'm not gonna make you raise your hand, but I respect you, all right? <laughs> just want you to know that. I respect you. It says that Jesus had a cushion. Jesus has a pillow. I love that detail about the story. It's not that he's just asleep. He's asleep on a cushion. He's asleep on a pillow, which just for a second, this makes the story even more fantastic because what that means is that when they got on the boat to go across to the other side, as they were stepping onto the boat, you ever stepped onto a boat? You have to raise your leg a little bit, right? Step onto the boat. As they were stepping onto the boat, Jesus was carrying a pillow. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that about our Savior. You think it's gonna be a really crazy storm, they're gonna get upset, perfect time for a nap. <laughs> Why? Because storms don't affect him the way they do us. I hope that encourages somebody. See, if Jesus is bailing water and pacing the ship, we're in trouble. Whatever storm you're walking through right now, doesn't affect him one bit. He's the son of God. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's doing great. He might even be taking a nap. You're like, I know it feels that way. It feels that way. I'm going through this storm. I don't even know if he's there. He's there. It just doesn't affect him the same way that it does us. Now, here's what can happen because of that. Fourth point. Storms can cause us to question the goodness of God. So I need you to see how the enemy works in our lives. It's the same thing he's doing in this story. So you're in a storm. Jesus is asleep. The enemy says, well, he's not there. No, he's there. He's just taking a nap. He's not worried about anything. He's at peace. He's at rest. But the enemy will try to convince us that that means he's actually absent. Now, look at how the disciples handle this entire situation. I think that we can all relate and maybe even have made these types of mistakes in our lives before. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? So they wake him up and they, they make this statement, teacher, don't you care if we drown? We're going to look at it in two parts, teacher, and then don't you care if we drown? So the first thing they say is teacher. And this is their first mistake because they do not address Jesus appropriately. So the word teacher is synonymous with rabbi. By saying teacher, what they're saying to Jesus is you're just like everybody else. But see, we're in Mark chapter four, early on in Jesus's ministry. They don't know everything about Jesus, but he's already referred to himself in the gospel of Mark as the son of man, as the son of God, as the son of the most high. He's done enough to let them know he is unlike anyone else they've ever been around. And they don't even call him by his name. They call him Teacher, and there's a really good insight there because see, they didn't address Jesus appropriately with the right authority, and that's what led them to make this statement, which is not a question, it's an accusation. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? It's not a question, it's an accusation. The foundation of which is not naming Jesus appropriately. Listen, when you don't see Jesus for who he is, King of Kings, Lord of lords, none like him. When you don't call on him by his rightful name, eventually your heart will turn on you and you'll start to blame him for the things in your life. People fall in that trap every day. They accuse God of the things that are happening in their lives and foundationally it's because they have too 
small of a view of God. This is why corporate worship matters so much. This is why I will unapologetically challenge you to be with God's people on Sundays. Listen, if you want better sermons, I could give you five churches right now that you get better sermons, okay? Better sermons. He's like, you serious? Yeah, meet me in the lobby. I'll tell you, okay? It's not because I think I have wonderful things to say and you just can't miss this. It's none of that. The reason why I challenge you to be here every week is because there are power when you worship with God's people. I say this all the time. What is real is more important than what is true. Some of you believe that God is real. You believe that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but that just doesn't match the real that you're walking through right now. You better get with God's people in worship. Sometimes we have to lean on one another, borrow worship from a brother or sister, because we don't have it in us. And God gave us his people. When we come together in this space and we call in the name of Jesus and we cry and worship, and maybe the church thing is still new and you're like, they sing every week before he gets up to preach. Is that how this works? That's how this works, okay? And it's not like the church I grew up in. If I can just be real, it kind of felt like just kind of filling time. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have said that, all right? <laughs> and then we had the, oh boy, I could say so many things. I'm not going to. I'm gonna behave today. All right, so it's not just to fill time. It's because that when we declare who Jesus is, when we sing songs like we sang earlier today, can I tell you what it does? It realigns your heart. It realigns your heart. It realigns your perspective. You walk into a room with the mindset and the heart posture of blaming God, and you leave the room recognizing Jesus led you into the storm. What happened there? Your heart shifted. And when our hearts shift through worship and we see Jesus for who he is, we don't accuse him, but we ask him questions. Jesus is big enough to handle your questions. It's okay to say, Jesus, I don't understand what you're doing in my life right now. It doesn't make sense. I can't really see what you're up to, but I will keep trusting you. I'll trust you. See, you can question Jesus without calling in to question his goodness. And the disciples blurred the lines on this particular evening simply because they didn't see Jesus for who he was. Fifth point, Jesus is more powerful than the storm. It's more powerful. I know that's obvious. I mean, it's, it's, it's the reason why the story is actually in the Bible. But man, I just need to be reminded of this so many times in my life. And so let's, again, look at the details for how it played out in the story. So Jesus got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Can you imagine being there and seeing this? Can you imagine being one of the disciples? You're scared for your life, and the next minute, nothing. It's quiet, it's calm. Jesus is more powerful than the storms in our life. Listen, I'm just gonna get as real as I can with y'all. Sometimes people think that pastors, you know, we don't walk through storms. Um, We do, and that may not surprise you, but what might surprise you is that that when I walk through a storm, so I'm not gonna speak for all pastors. Let me just speak for me. When I go through a storm, let me tell you what happens. My anxiety and my fear and my worry goes through the roof, through the roof. Everything that I tell y'all not to do, I do. I do it. I've read the verse, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, submit your request to the Lord and the peace of God will surround your heart. (laughs) Anxiety goes through the roof. (laughs) Worry goes through the roof. Can't see how this is all gonna happen. I'm losing my mind. My emotions are all over the place. And here's what I forget. Jesus is in the boat with me. He's in the boat. Now, he might be asleep. (laughs) I might need to nudge him a little bit, but he's in the boat. And so many times, the Lord just has to remind me of that. Adam, I will not leave you or forsake you. I'm here with you in the middle of your storm. 
And do you know what I want Jesus to do immediately when I remember? That's right, he's in the boat. I've actually taught Mark chapter four. When I'm reminded of this, do you know what I want Jesus to do? I want him to calm the storm all around me. Like he does in the story. External things happening in my life. Other people that might be coming after me. Circumstances that are working against me. I want him to calm those storms. But do you know what Jesus is more interested in? Calming the storm in me. In me. And it doesn't always happen instantaneously. It's a process. But as I talk to Jesus about what's going on, do you know what he begins to do to my heart? He says, quiet. Be still. And my anxiety starts to drop. My worries start to go away. My fears start to subside. And here's what's interesting. All of the other things around me haven't changed. But I've changed. Because Jesus is stronger than the storm. And whatever storm you're walking through, listen to me. He's stronger than that storm. And if you get to those same places that I get to, listen. It's because we get focused on the storm. And we forget who's in the boat with us. And sometimes just that simple reminder, wait a second, I'm not alone. Jesus is with me. I'm going to talk to him about what I'm going through right now. He will bring peace to your soul. He will bring calm. He will say, be still. And, and, as, and, as, and as crazy as the story where the waves immediately stop, he can actually do that for us as well. But we've got to talk to him. We've got to tell him what's going on in our lives. But if you don't recognize that he's more powerful than the storm you're walking through, you'll never talk to him. Here's the sixth point for us today. Storms are actually an opportunity to get to know Jesus better. To get to know Jesus better. Sometimes we think that the way we get to know Jesus better is by learning more things about Jesus. They're two separate categories, but I would encourage you to pursue both. See, it's important to learn about Jesus. What do I mean? Bible study. What do I mean? A good discipleship course. What do I mean? Digging deep into God's word. This is one of the ways that we can ground our faith. But that's not the same as knowing Jesus. If you want to know Jesus in a way you don't know him, he's going to take you to a place you've never been before to see some things about him that you would not have seen unless he took you to that place. And what I'm suggesting today is oftentimes that place is a storm. This happens for the disciples. After all of this, look what they say. Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You ever had a who is this moment in your life with Jesus? Amen. Somebody stopped me a few weeks ago. They, they, they participated. You may be new, so you missed this. So just roll with it for a second. Back in January, we did something called a tithe challenge. We do it a couple times a year. And we, we, we challenged people to tithe. And, and they, they, they took up on the tithe challenge and they started tithing. And, and they literally were like, I cannot believe what the Lord's doing in my life right now. They were having a who is this moment. Like I took God up at his word. I tried it by faith. Who is this that the Lord would act on my behalf? Who is this Jesus that he cares enough about the details of your life? And if no one's told you that lately, Jesus cares about the details of your life. The reason why a lot of you won't sit down and talk with Jesus is because you're worried about what he might say to you. I already know what he would say to you. So I'm gonna tell you. The only thing Jesus wants to tell you right now is that he loves you. That he's for you. That he gave his life for you. You say, but there's a bunch of stuff I've done that I need to talk to him about. He, paid, he already paid for that on the cross. You sit down and talk to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, there's all this sin in my life. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. I died for it. I'm just glad you're here. Let's talk. There's some things about Jesus he'd love for you to know about himself. And perhaps some of you are actually, this is so crazy. You're at this amazing point of breakthrough. And you think you're in the worst place you've ever been. It's because Jesus is about to show you a side of himself that a week from now, a month from now, or a year from now, you're going to be going, who is this Savior? So keep walking, keep moving by faith. There's some things about him that he wants you to see. And then finally, number seven, storms bring us back to the foundation of our faith. Just bring us back, just, just strip away all of the other things. So many times we can add so many things and, and, and a storm has a way of just clarifying things 
bringing us back to the foundation of our faith. What is the foundation of our faith? That, that can sound like a pretty loaded question or maybe even a question that's difficult to, to answer. And so let me give you a, a quick little story. I shared this with our teenagers a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night, but years ago, I was getting my teeth cleaned. I've had them cleaned since, but in this particular time, <laughs> about 20 years ago, the individual cleaning my teeth found out I was a pastor and started talking. And um, she said, well, you know, I, I, I believe in the Big Bang Theory and I believe in evolution and I don't really think God created stuff. And I think we're kind of, you know, byproducts of all that. And I can't really respond because I don't know if you missed the detail. She's cleaning my teeth, all right? So she's saying this <laughs> while cleaning my teeth. She finally finishes and, you know, I, you know, I sit up and, and I'm like, yeah, like I, I totally get it. I mean, that's what you were taught in school. And there's a lot of people who believe that. And and, and I understand where you're coming from. And I said, but for me, and this was my way of trying to shift the conversation without you know, being combative. I, I said, for me at least, it's always come back to three really simple questions. The first of which, was Jesus really God's son? The second question is, was he really dead on the cross? And then the third question is, was he really alive again? And after I said those three questions, she went, huh, you ever had a, somebody drop a huh on you? Now, if you're not from the South, that's like a light bulb. That's what that is, okay? <laughs> that's what that is. I know we, lots of people, lots of backgrounds. She dropped a huh on me. And here's what she said. I guess your answers to those three questions give you your answers to everything else. I said, exactly. Because it's the foundation of our faith. The foundation of our faith, church, is that Jesus is God's son. God sent him because you couldn't get to God. There was nothing you could ever do that would make you good enough to get to God, and there's no amount of bad you could ever do that would keep you from God. Jesus was God's way of proving that to you. So he sent his own son, who then willingly went to the cross for you out of obedience to the Father. He paid the price for all sin through his death, and then he walked out of the tomb on the third day, this is the foundation of our faith. There really were 500 people who saw Jesus alive after he was dead. It's recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have more historical copies of 1 Corinthians than any other document in all of antiquity. There's evidence that Jesus was alive after he was a dead. dead. Jesus really did then ascend into heaven, and he promised to return, and he really did send the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter two, and these same guys that were scared in a boat, empowered by the Holy Spirit, changed the world in the first century. All of these things happened. It's the foundation of our faith. We have God's word. We have the Holy Spirit. We have all of these things. We have God's people. And so many times when we're going through a storm, we just lose sight of all of that, and we lose sight of the simplicity of just coming back to what Jesus has already said, coming back to the promises that God has already given us in his word. And if the disciples had just come back to the simplicity of what Jesus had already said, they could have avoided all of the fear they faced that night. Let's go back to the way the story starts in verse 35. Here's what Jesus says. To the disciples, before he invites them into the boat, let us go over to the other side, and then there's a period, y'all. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. The title of this message is misleading. The title of the message should not be led into a storm. The title should be led through a storm. Amen. Led to the other side. See, the moment that Jesus said, let us go to the other side, they should have been at complete rest. If they'd really listened to what Jesus was saying, let us go to the other side, here's what they would have recognized. Our Lord has already declared it to be true. We're gonna go to the other side of this lake. If they had listened to our Savior, they could have gotten onto that boat with a pillow too. <laughs> Completely at rest. Some of you need to hear the words of our Savior today. Here's what he's saying to you. Let's get to the other side. The evidence of the storm is not evidence that you're not gonna to get to the other side. Here's all it is, evidence of a storm. A storm that comes and a storm that will go. Many of you pledged your life to your spouse many years ago. Until death do us part, we will get to the other side 
and you're in a place right now where you're ready to quit. But see, Jesus has already said he's gonna get you to the other side. You're just in a storm. Don't you quit in the midst of the storm. Many of you are facing some parenting challenges right now with a child, and here's what Jesus is saying to you today. We're gonna get to the other side. I've already declared it to be true. If you could see everything about that child's life one day, you'd already be on the other side with me. I just need you to keep going, even though you're in a storm. Some of you right now are in the middle of a a business venture, perhaps even a a business you started. God placed this dream in your heart. Jesus has already said, we're gonna get to the other side. You're just stuck in a storm, and you're thinking about quitting. Don't you quit in a storm. He's going to take you to the other side. And then for some of you, maybe today's the first day you're connecting the dots that when Jesus says, let's get to the other side, ultimately he's talking about getting you to the other side of this life to be with him on the shores of heaven for all of eternity. And life's storms have thrown you off course. But see, for those of us who accepted Jesus as our Savior, one day when we've been in heaven for 10,000 years, do you know what we will see all of this life on earth as? One big storm. And when we've been in heaven for 10,000 years, that'll be but a grain of sand in the shores of heaven. We'll just be getting started. And for some of you today, it's the first time you've realized, wait a second, Jesus came and gave his life so that I could spend eternity with him in heaven, but also so that I could get through the storms that I'm facing today. Would you bow your head with me this morning? And if that's where you're at, you've never come to a place in your life where you've asked Jesus to come into your life and to save you. Can I just encourage you, just in the quietness of this moment, to just say, Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for my sin and that you're alive, you walked out of the tomb on the third day. I wanna ask you to come into my life and save me. And from this day forward, my life belongs to you. Until I see you face to face for all of eternity, I'll live for you for all the days you give me here on this earth. Hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, everybody's heads are bowed and their eyes are closed, but I do wanna pray for you this week. Will you just slip your hand up just so I can pray for you this week? All over the room, thank you. Thank you, I'll be praying for you this week. Thank you. Jesus, your people are hurting. Many are walking through a storm. Having forgotten that you're in the boat with us. Lord, many of us are ready to quit because of the storm. Lord, I pray that as we come into this time of response, you would once again just pour out your spirit in this place, that you would invade this room with your presence. You would help us just to come alive in you. Many of us, for the first time, we've just experienced salvation. For others of us, coming alive in a new and a fresh way where we recognize you've been with us all along. So Lord, help us to see you for who you are and have the right response in our heart. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church, please stand with us if you're able, and let's respond. Let's let this song be our war cry today. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise Where every demon trembles Where we proclaim your name This is a house of healing Our hearts are full of our full attention God you have the final say so come alive in the name of Jesus come alive in the name of Jesus this is a house of miracles and we bring everything to 
the feet of Jesus everything in the name of Jesus this is a house of miracles Whoa. House of Miracles, and this place is for you. Thanks so much for joining us. Remember, if there's any way that we can connect with you, be sure to check out those links in our description so that we can do just that. But we can't wait to see you right back here next week as we conclude our series, Jesus Unscripted. Y'all know it. Come on, walk with me to the fountain, to the well that's never dry. Put your hope in living water.